great relationships don't just happen. If you want one, you've got to make it yourself. But how do you do that when you didn't have the models and examples that you needed? Some of us were lucky enough to have seen one or two solid marriages growing up. But that's not really enough since what worked for them isn't necessarily going to work for you. And lots of us just started doing marriage and love and relationships the way we thought was expected, only to find ourselves in a love story that's, I don't know, okay, I guess? There's no right one right way to do love. That's good news. You can let go of all that old baggage and craft a marriage or partnership or chosen family or polycule or whatever that is so much more than okay. It's really the creation of a life that finally feels like home. At least, that's what doing this has felt like for me. Me too. And getting here wasn't easy. It wasn't easy for us. We learned the hard way, the very hard way, that love is a verb. And the actions of love don't just come naturally. We all need skills and tools and support to do this well. And that's completely normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton, research psychologist and ASEC certified sexuality educator. I'll be sharing personal stories, evidence-based research, and case studies from my work as a relationship coach. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Um, I'm a human doing my best to make relationships my biggest priority in life. We're going to dig deep and offer vulnerable conversations between us as we keep learning how to customize our love and keep growing as individuals. As individuals. As individuals. And as a couple. And as a moresome. It's all very interesting. And we're also going to have some amazing nuanced conversations with experts who can help you learn more ways to design the life you want. And if you find yourself saying at any point, damn, I really needed to hear that while you're listening, I would love it, we would love it, if you would head over and give us a quick rate and review on iTunes. It really does help other people find us, and we'd be so grateful for that. Now, it's time to reimagine your relationship from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Hey, so... We have a great interview to talk about today. We had a great conversation with Megan Batia. Yeah, this was a really fun conversation for me. I, I'm guessing it was for you too, because Megan is somebody who was featured in the same Vogue article right. that our story was featured in. Vogue did an article recently, um, a fantastic writer, Michelle Ruiz, wrote about um, people trying out polyamory and what, what it might look like. Um, what open relating looks like. And she chose to feature, the author chose to feature these these stories of people actually trying open relating alongside some of the data and what the research tells us. So she also featured um, Dr. Amy Moore's research, um, which is quite extensive in the field of non-monogamies. Um, and what I loved about that article was actually that it connected me with a bunch more people Um, who are out there in the world doing the same kind of work that you and I are. Right, and um, talking with Megan, she she comes into it from such a different place from us, and it's awesome to talk to somebody with a different set of perspectives on everything. Yeah, I think the thing that strikes me is it's so so easy to get myopic. Even even in this, you know, bigger world that I have, by having more partners and by having a lot of freedom um, to choose how my life goes, I still feel like I can forget pretty easily how many ways there are to choose to do open relating because it's so many. And so Megan's going to talk to us about, you'll hear a a great description of how she came to the decision of opening up and figuring out how to do that in a way that was authentic for her relationship. Um, Like us, she has kids and already had kids when she chose to follow this path. Um, And yet, the story is, yeah, like you said, so different. And it makes me think about how each of us decided. Because recently I I realized, I did the the year count. How'd that go? (laughs) I realized that between the two of us, uh, we've got like over four decades of some form of open relationship experience. That's many decades. And for one thing, it means that we're a little bit older than I, than I okay. sometimes yeah. remember yeah. Um, that we are. But 
but we've come to be open in very different ways. Like your experience in those early yeah. years, like how did you decide? Yeah, so um, in a way, I don't remember deciding. Uh, it, it was something I always kind of felt was um, part in the back of my mind. Like, this, this is fine. This, this would be a fine way. And so when I was in all the, the monogamous relationships that I was in, um, I was like, yeah, that's how things are right now. They could change. And I was always open to the possibility there'd be something else. And then... Um, my my first wife wanted to have a relationship with somebody else. I was like, okay. It, I think that that's one of the comments you make that I watch other people's, people who've only experienced more um, conventional monogamy. I think that's the where I see their jaw drop or their quizzical face mm -hmm. turn on because I think we don't expect that level of... Um, uh, just an okayness with letting go of the the the, the, yeah. the mystique of what monogamy is and what it means and what it has to mean. It has to mean that we do all of these things exclusively. And even if you were to say, okay, well, you stepped outside of the monogamous paradigm, we still have a question of how did you so so fluidly mm -hmm. decide that whatever was happening could be okay. But the way I know you, I know that that's a that's a, like an innate quality of you. You are really good at being okay with whatever you've decided. Yes, it's a combination <laughs> of um, uh, what is the word for egotism? <laughs> when I like, I just uh, my, the the a part of me is like the rightness of myself. I'm right. Because right. so this is for me. It is a self-centered perspective mm -hmm. that has led you there. And I think it's, a, it's an interesting way to leverage. Um, Nikita Ren Thigpen talks about being selfish. And she talks about it in this, like, yeah, be selfish. Right. Be selfish, capital S, self. Like, take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Put your needs and desires at the center of how you're making some decisions for your life. Because if you don't, you're sort of... You're martyring yourself right out of the gate. Yeah, and I martyr myself for a lot of things. But in this, in these situations, there were these messages that the culture was like, this is how things should be. And you know me. I'm oh, a you... defiant punk. Yeah, you're uh, very reactive. I'm very reactive. It's like, you should do things this way. How about if I don't? And so that feeds into my, uh, my comfort with saying, I'm going to do this other thing. Okay. How about you? So the notion of reactance stands out to me there, though, mm -hmm. because you you have we um our not cool way of saying it is you're a bit of a fucker. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was trying to keep it. I didn't want to check out no, the that's explicit fine. box. It's, it's fine. a little. It's it's yeah, a, defiant fucker is yeah. But but that can, what I hear you describing is that you have at your core a sense that you should get to decide how your relationship is built. You and the pre people that you're in relationship to. Would and that is a primary <laughs> tenet of my work. Like when right. I talk about the five pillars that you need in order to open a relationship happily, you need to believe that relationships can and should be designed right. for the people who are in them. Right. And not everybody does. And that's, it. so if you're, if you're struck right now by how basic that is, I just wanna say, yeah, it is fairly basic, but look around and really consider, are the people around you, or maybe you can be introspective and, and look at yourself, are you really acting like relationships can and should be custom built for the people who are in them, for the, for the needs, wants, values, desires of the people who are in those relationships? Or did you pick up a script and decide that you, gotta, you just gotta adhere to it in some way? And the thing is, I'm still finding ways that I have picked up scripts and I'm oh, reading yeah. from this script and I'm not living my authentic self. I'm still unpacking that. So right. I don't think this is a, this is not easy. It's not easy and it's not a single moment where you're like, okay, I'm going to set down all the scripts. I've well, transcended that. <laughs> nope. not, none of that. I'm not into it. it. I think that's a great way to snow yourself. Yeah. It's, um, it comes up when we hear people say, I've mastered this. Yep. I'm like, Because uh... you stop looking for the ways that you haven't and now those things are just kicking you around and you don't even know it necessarily right so you asked what my way in was and I in the part 
of open relating that is about being in love or loving multiple people, I don't think I ever not did that. That came very naturally to me. Um, I noticed it from the time I was a young teenager at the very least. Um, but I still thought that I would grow up, find a person, marry them and do the thing, all the exclusive things because I had no idea that anything else existed. And I did that, but I always, I separated out the promises that I made to be exclusive from whether I was having feelings about someone else. I just separated those things. I never acted on those feelings, except I did. I would act in loving ways to people. I just didn't have sex with them. Right. Yeah. I didn't touch them in ways that we have cordoned off and said those are just for in love relationships. I, I, so I had this sort of um, blind spot to my own multiplicity. I, I was mm -hmm. living in a very multiplicity oriented way uh, when it came to love, but then I would still say, I, you know, I was, I was behaving as a monogamous person. I was doing all the things I was supposed to be doing, including cheating. Like I cheated on my, when I was engaged to be married the first time. Um, I cheated when I was 18. I got engaged when I was 17. I cheated for about a year when I was 18 um, because my relationship was not satisfying me and I decided to look elsewhere. And then when it came out, when I, when it was discovered, I cut those, those cheating relationships out and I, that was done. And I, I again, picked up the monogamy picked up the script. and the, the script still never fit. I kept falling in love with other people, but I behaved myself. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, um, and then you came along. Now I'd known you the whole time. I've known you my whole life. Most of that time, the first 33 years, the first 32 years and 11 months, say, <laughs> yeah. I thought that you were pretty obnoxious. You were very arrogant. and I. But mostly That's I thought true. that you were removed from me. I thought of you as a grown-up and I thought of myself as a kid because mm. of our age difference and, our, and who we had grown up near. We lived in the same neighborhood and everything. Yeah. But when I saw you and in a pure sort of way, and I had this, this numinous experience of like, whoa, this is a soul standing in front of me, and I felt connected to you, that was when I knew I had to get really clear about what the hell monogamy meant. I didn't have any other words for it, but my next move, my very next move was to tell my partner, your partner, all of our close friends, I was like, I don't know what's happening, but I'm in love and I got to deal with this. It's too overwhelming for me to handle on my own. And well, it caused a lot of problems, <laughs> a lot of problems. It, it, I'm sorry. I, it did. And that's, you know, I think that's related to scripts and all those sorts of things. Sure. But I love that you felt like, because you, like, so I came in with like, well, whatever I'm thinking must be right about myself. So cool. But you come into it from everything is talk aboutable. Right, so I did think things were talk aboutable, and it was in the setting I was in, naive. I, if I could go back and change something, the thing I would change is I would have turned to myself and really taken a deep look at whether my needs, wants, desires were being met myself, like by myself, not by anyone else, by myself, before I set my sights on a person, mm -hmm. because that made it so much harder. The conversations I started having with my husband about opening up became all muddied and mired by the fact that you were this real, actual, live person. So you now could be the target. You could be the, the potential interrupter, right? right? And that was much harder than having theoretical discussions mm -hmm. about... Yeah. And, and the thing I always stress when people are just considering opening up Go to the imagination first. And if you go to the imagination first and you start working that, you have the opportunity to get to deal with some complicated situations without them being attached to a real person because you became burdened with a lot of what was going on between my first husband and I. And I wouldn't necessarily go back and change it because I don't know. I like how things are now, and I know that if you change one thing, you change everything. But how I discovered polyamory was Googling, looking for some answer mm -hmm. as to how it was even possible that I could be this over the top in love with two people at the same time. 
And eventually I stumbled on that word. And, you know, it was 2009. We didn't have the resources we have now. But what I didn't go looking for, and I wish I had, is, you know, what about being in love with myself? <laughs> and uh, Megan, yes. Megan got there much quicker than me. So she's going to tell her story of how she and her husband at the time had figured out that opening would be a decision that they wanted to make. And Megan talks about coming home to the self, and her work is about being with yourself. And so. I find that to be a really profound aspect that I don't hit as frequently, or I didn't hit as frequently in my own early experience. And if I could go back and do something different, that is a piece I would add. It's a good one. So, yeah, without further ado, let's uh, introduce Megan to the audience. Yeah. So, Megan Batia believes that to change the world, we need to first change the way we relate to ourselves and others. Uh, her in-person and online courses revolve around the topics of self-love, fluid relationship structures, and coaching people to create the lives they love. She currently lives in Costa Rica with her twin six-year-olds and her two partners. Well, yeah, now listen in to a great conversation. Hi, Megan. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm thrilled to have this conversation. And I know Ken was really excited about how excited I was to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Because yeah. <laughs> there is something magic that happens when you meet some people. You and I met by total kismet. We were featured in the same Vogue article about ethical non-monogamy. And when we first talked, I'm like, we have to talk more. So thank you. <laughs> really, I felt the same way. I felt like that one conversation, all, it went longer than we both expected. And I felt like we were just scratching the surface. So thank you so much. It's an honor to have a chance to talk with you again and to meet you, Ken. Yes, and to meet you. And, and featured in the same Vogue article. That's a great That's line. A great yeah. line. <laughs> so anybody who hasn't read it, I, Megan and I, I think you and I are the people who got the most bare in that particular article, that was, mm -hmm, I agree. There were some, there was some real rawness. So I highly recommend taking a read because oh. it's, it's a complex topic, polyamory, non-monogamy. It's, and sometimes we only get the, the most surface views, the really pretty surface views. And I think um, the author did a great job. Michelle did a great job of just diving in. She really did. And I have to give my two partners such a, amazing credit, uh, Marty and Kyle, because I feel like although the Michelle had interviewed me directly, um, they didn't get a chance to have their voices shared and they have different perspectives as well. And I know that in, if we look at the cultural norms for two men, two, two straight heterosexual men to admit and share what they did through the article, which, which is our meeting story. It's kind of how this all developed. So I can't be open and not share that story on how the first couple experiences were they were three three sons just to jump right in for your your career uh, <laughs> three sons with two straight heterosexual men like yes this gender men like here you go this is the exactly. thing we hear can't happen exactly yet it did <laughs> I'm so proud of them and they are just so secure and beautiful human beings. And uh, yeah, I just, I feel like this is opening up an, another world. I remember being on the receiving end of someone else sharing their story when I was reading it five years ago and I couldn't have imagined it. So yes. it was really nice for me to be the article, like to be the story that was being shared was really surreal. That's so, it. That's crazy. it. So tell us, because the audience isn't sitting in front of the article right now, would you share with us just a, a little bit about how you found yourself in the wild world of non-monogamy? <laughs> well, like I was saying, when I first was introduced to the idea, it was exciting and kind of scary. Uh, Marty started bringing up the idea of it and he kind of processed a lot of his own jealousy. He started asking me about past boyfriends, and uh, to give a, a short synopsis, we had kids at that point. Um, they were, tw they, they are twins. They are now six. They were then two. And I, Marty says to me now that he felt like I had lost something. Uh, my heart, my, you know, me probably due to sleep loss and much more. But I do think that there's a lot that we can lose in relationships without even realizing it. 
So we had gone down that path already 15 plus years together. And I think he was starting to look at what does it take to open up this woman's heart again? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And what is that going to be like? So he brought up these ideas. We started talking about it. It was an exciting time. It took us maybe a year of talking about what it would look and feel like, uh, explore it. And we had some adventures. I'm going to give the really quick synopsis. The adventures are fun. (laughs) There's so many, there's so many different things that happened, but uh, fast forward, I now have another partner. His name is Kyle. Um, My husband, Marty has another partner. She uh, is not open publicly. So I keep her identity private. And I totally respect that. I think each of us have to decide how open we want to be. So right now we're all living in Costa Rica. I live primarily with my husband, Marty, although he and I alternate days with our other partners. So from one person, I mean, really for people that are just new to this topic, I think it looks and sounds a little weird to me. It feels totally normal (laughs) because this is just what works and it's meeting all my needs and we're constantly pivoting and changing a little bit. But I think it's honestly so hard to remember even how I was relating to my relationship then because it's changed so much. That, oh, that is such a juicy way. You have, Ken has a great, um, he he really went through a lot when we introduced um, uh, non-monogamy into into our, our, our triad at the time. It was a lot about like, what is the relationship? Is it separate from us? Is the, the relationship itself? So I, what I heard you just say reminds mm-hmm. me so much of what you would say, Ken. Totally. It's think, thinking back, it's, it's hard to imagine. Right. Like put myself back into the mindset that it accepted things as they were without, um, well, just that accepted things with their, as they were and didn't look for anything else, didn't look for what I needed or wanted and just let it be. Yeah, that to your credit, I think the fact that you can't even remember what it was like <laughs> shows you how much work you've done to That's shift. It. I mean, this is right. the internal work that we're doing, shifting inside out. And like you said, asking ourselves those questions of, I don't think I ever even asked myself either what I wanted in a relationship. Like what, so what is a relationship? Even those fundamental questions now that are my everyday world, how do I want to create this relationship? What needs are these meeting? You know, how have I changed? How have they changed? How do we need to pivot? Like all of this wasn't even in my consciousness. And it sounds like maybe that's where you were at as well. Totally. Exactly. Just, yeah. just that. And when, when I hear that co- question now, so when I hear somebody talk about relationships now, I instantly feel lit up and excited, but I do remember. So for us, this goes back 13 years. So yeah. I remember being, we were each married to other people and the, those first questions about what is a relationship anyways, if, you know, if they're going, if we're going to do something different, what does that mean? I didn't feel excited. I felt terrified. I felt terrified right to the core of my being because I had a bunch of kids. And I just think it's worth noting you had children as well already when you opened up. And a lot of times that's the piece that blows people's mind. They're like, I could imagine it pre-kids or I could imagine it post-kids, but you know, post, they grow up. In other words, not post, they're not going anywhere. Um, <laughs> but that, that stage of life when the kids are little, especially like my youngest was two and your, your youngest biological children were three. Um, people often feel like that's the shocking thing that you were even questioning, that you were entertaining any questions of like, what is a relationship for? What do I need from it? I think that when we go into child rearing mode, it's easy to set down everything else. So I resonate with what you're saying Marty was seeing. There's a, like a loss, there's a loss that comes. And I was deep. I was 10 years into my motherhood for biological babies. When all of a sudden I woke up one day, like, oh no, oh no. Relationship isn't, this isn't what I need it to be. And I think a lot of people thought that the kids would be the anchor point, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, the kids are the anchor. You don't change things because kids shouldn't experience change. But now, 13 years later, I can't imagine not yeah. having shaken things up and let yeah. the kids be part of a bigger world. And, and I remember well, that feeling of being like, but but what about the kid's stability? But I just now I just always think of, of finding Nemo. Well, if nothing ever happens to him, nothing will ever happen to him. 
And I really get that now. <laughs> That's oh it. Gosh, yeah, I have, uh, there's so many different ways I want to take this. First, I can totally relate to so many people because there is this fear that comes up. Because everyone, I think, I've never met someone that's like, I want to be a bad parent. You know, many people are like, I want to be a great parent. I want to provide a really safe, loving home for my kids. The question is our how. (laughs) How do we do that? And I think when we don't use ourselves as like the main teaching tool, not what Mm. we say, but what we do, how we be, um, that to me is where I always anchor myself. If someone questions like, well, how about your kids? You know, what do they think about you not being home every night or your husband not being home every night? And for me, I always come back to, they are seeing a mommy that is happy and empowered and creating a life that she loves. And it looks like this. I hope that that's the implicit learning that they're going to get because they're six now, you know, they're, they, they just know what they know. It just, this to them is normal. Um, But my hope is in that 10, 20 years, they look back and go, wow, thanks mom and dad for really being adventurous in in creating your own life and showing us that we could, and that we, that putting yourself first and really um, meeting your own needs creates a safe place for, you know, for kids to be raised. So I think so many people have the good intentions of wanting to create a safe and stable household for their kids, but then do it in a way that's self-sacrificing, but in a martyr, in a resentful way that just tears apart the relationship. Yeah, yeah. Then that's what kids are exposed to, because that was my upbringing up until my parents got divorced when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really, I learned to resent. I learned to don't speak your needs. I learned like all the things I don't want to teach my kids. Um, but not, I don't blame my parents. You know, they did the the best that they could. They stayed together as long as they could for us. And so I just, we're just flipping that around a little bit. (laughs) That's it. The, the idea that there is a, a single way to raise children. I think most uh, thoughtful people have, have realized that there isn't just one way to raise kids. Still, this pushes the boundaries. This pushes the edges. And I remember so keenly having to really plant my stake in the ground and say, I want my children to experience me happy, like you're saying, but also to experience um, more, more parents, more parenting. I thought that that was a plus. And I was struck by how many people really didn't feel that. How many people were like, but there'll be step parents in your children's lives. And oh my God. And the like literal clutching of the pearls. Um, (laughs) And I didn't, I didn't experience that because my own parents had been so hostile and angry as they were, they were in love. They never got divorced. They, they happily went to each of their graves in love, but in a very hostile way. Mm -hmm. So there are so many ways to do this that look like the right way, staying together, um, not speaking your needs, shoving it all down. So there are so many ways to do that. This isn't really that radical. If you compare it to so many other ways that we don't quite nail really showing our kids how to, how to be there for themselves. So the way I I see it is I'm still learning how to relate. I think that these are fundamental skills that I didn't learn in school. I don't know if any school is teaching relating skills. And so for me, I feel like I'm deep. I've deconstructed my life. I'm still deconstructing it down to the level of how do I relate to myself? because I feel like that's even more core. And if anything, my journey of polyamory and having two loving partners just brought me to this fact that, wow, I don't even know if I have a loving, secure relationship with myself. Holy cow, maybe I should look at that and work on that one too. <laughs> and not, not one or before the other, you know, it was just this beautiful realization. So that sent me down a whole beautiful rabbit hole into now just what I call the self-love journey. And, and really understanding myself. And now I feel like I've got more, a lot more framework for what does it mean to relate and how do we relate healthily? And so in my geek out way, I have to have a framework to understand it. So the framework that I've created is super simple. It's body, heart, mind, and spirit. And to me, that just means what is the health in every sector? Am I physically healthy? Am I mentally healthy? Am I emotionally healthy? Am I spiritually healthy? And spiritual, that meaning for me more um, is, do I know and understand my purpose? Mm -hmm. And in a relationship, I think we have to be also spiritually healthy in that, like, what is our purpose of the relationship? And that can change. We can reinvent that constantly. Um, For individual, for me, that that shows up as what's my purpose? How do I feel like I'm uh, giving meaning 
to my life, how am I playing a small piece of this hum human puzzle? <laughs> uh, but these feel now so core and so elementary, like, oh, of course, I, these are all areas that we have to pay attention to every day, physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And then same thing in our relationships. Are we emotionally connecting? Are we emotionally current? Um, are we mentally connecting? Where are our beliefs? And sometimes I have to check myself if I'm having a bad day and mentally stuck, I might project a future that is really dismal. <laughs> and to me, that doesn't mean that that future is going to happen. That means that's a reflection back to, wow, Megan, you're, where are your thoughts at right now? Yeah. Woo, take a minute. So you're not grounded there. Like get grounded in your mental health, your thoughts. Right. So again, it feels so simple to me, but I feel like this journey of polyamory has been the catalyst for my own personal growth in a way that no other formal education has. How about you? I'm so curious for 13 <laughs> years down the road. Well, yes, it's a great big yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that without polyamory, the two of us, we were each on a, we were on a path of self growth, but, um, it wasn't leading us, either was of I? us. <laughs> I, I Yeah, I, I think that we were, but it was, it was, it was quite, um, it was like a tight spiral. It was really, really tight. I think of the, I always think of opening as like this, this beautiful spiral journey that we're on, right? And both of us were walking around in almost yeah. concentric circles, yep. but yeah, constantly that. seeking, which are just like, okay, but I'm still, I keep stumbling across the same thing and I don't feel like I've gotten anywhere and opening up and really reinventing relating meant that we were well we had to reinvent ourselves and i became literally a different person i, I no one who knew me before really understands like i i really changed because i i was raised in a really toxic and a hostile household so i was very i was loud and um verbally aggressive and really hard and that sort of went away yeah. over the years of coming to love myself. Wow. Well, so, so many ways that, that this journey has, has changed me. Well, I have relatives who just don't believe it. They, yeah. they don't believe that this is who I am because I've learned, I mean, I've in my relationship with myself, I've learned some um, patience and understanding. And I try to project that out as much as I can to the world in a way that I never did before. And there are people who just don't buy it. And wow. uh, oh well, you it's, know, there's nothing I can do about that. No, um, it's sometimes easier for people to hold on to the version that they know of you because that feels safe. And I totally understand. I scared people when I started changing like this because yeah. their reality was shifting. I wasn't doing it on purpose, but right. by me sharing my growth and my path, I was making them unstable for like, wait, you're not the person I thought you were. If you're not, and if that's where my safety is external <laughs> and it, it's external in a way that if I know who everyone is and I keep track of all that, nothing changes, then I'm safe. And uh, I, I mean, my parents come around, but I definitely feel like I gave my parents heart attack when I shared that I, Marty and I were opening our relationship. And yeah, I mean, a lot has changed and I, I would love to say I've taken everybody with me on the journey. I want that to happen, but I also know that it's people choose, people choose, right? If they want to step into that journey. But Jolie, that that image that you said about people walking around in concentric circles seeking, right? Everybody's seeking and intending and wanting growth and longing for it. But you're right, stumbling across the same obstacles. And yeah. then there's something literal about opening up that spiral that you then can grow and that's i'm gonna hold on to that one thank yeah. you if you are totally loving this conversation i want to invite you to join us live megan ken and i are collaborating on a special project an opportunity june no july, july 2nd, 2nd july 2nd 2022 so it's just coming up in like a hot minute so I want you to join us for Love Expanded. It's happening in Blooming Grove, New York. Um, it's going to be a day of play, connection. We're going to talk about the ability to accept ourselves fully, exactly how we are, connect with each other, and to explore a world of possibilities. This isn't just for people who are open relating or who know that they're open relating. It's for anybody who wants to dig in and do the work of deeper relating and do your own work to relate to yourself and I'm excited. I'm really excited for the conversations we're going to have.
So if you're interested, um, I don't have the registration link yet because it's that hot off the presses. We yep. are putting this together quick because Megan's coming up from Costa Rica. So um, you can just email admin at joliehamilton.com and we'll make sure that you get a registration link. This is going to be a really fun day. I would love to see you there and meet in person. Can't wait. So yeah, the, and how I, how I draw that image out is and then you come across those same obstacles. You're going to spiral around. That same obstacle yeah. will be there, but you will feel, and this is how you know that you're growing, you feel how you're meeting it from a different place. So the same obstacle, new place. Same obstacle, new place. And now 13 years into this way of relating and growing, there are certain things that now when they come up, I actually celebrate them. They're exciting. Like for me, jealousy is one of those things. Jealousy comes up and I'm like, oh, right. I'm in a new spot. And I mean, that's my life's work. So of course that one catches my attention, but I think most of us aren't trained to be looking for our growth moments as joyful because they're painful a lot of times. And this one, this leaves us in a spot where growth moments are, they're often both pleasurable and uncomfortable. Mm. I, I think that's really helpful. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful, Ken. Well, I was just so we have all these these changes that we experience as we as we grow and as our and I mean for me as my relationship to myself has changed at first without me even noticing it and then starting to add some intentionality to it. Um, where do you see people getting stuck in that? So there I am. I'm working on my relationship with myself. Where do you see sticking points there? Mm for people on their own growth. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's a very human thing to, to be afraid, to feel scared. Mm -hmm. and I think Julie, whatever you just said, how you said it reminded me of that. It's how we're relating to what's going on. And I don't think we have a lot of the framework to understand and to create the relationship. Again, in my world, everything is relationships. The idea of the future and the past, they're just relationships. They're relationships yeah. to the past, relationship to the future. We're in a relationship uh, with wh whomever we're speaking, whatever we're doing. Uh, but I think it's, the re it's understanding the fundamentals of relationships that we're missing, ironically, <laughs> in order to have good relationships with ourselves and others. So for me, I think if it's a simple mindset switch of can I embrace this with curiosity? Like what you were just showing us by example is getting curious and getting excited when you hit that trigger point again. Sometimes for me, those, still, those moments still show up as triggers. Yeah. And instead of relating to them like, oh my God, I need to shut this down and I'm not capable of being with this feeling that's in my body. That's how I related to those points before, right? It was like trigger, didn't yeah. even know the word. It was like, this feels awful, shut it down, blame somebody, get this feeling out of my body. Yeah. Now, now I've shifted that whole orientation. That whole relationship is like, woo, triggered. Whoa, I don't feel this very often. What in the world is going on? I'm going to get curious. Okay, how does this feel in my body? Hmm, okay, my stomach's tight. What does that mean? How am I translating that sensation? Can I sit with this? I mean, I find that the number one thing is most people cannot physically sit with the sensations in their body. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't blame them. We're taught, I am teaching at my kids' school now, and even six-year-olds, when I bring up the emotion conversation, they're like, these are the good emotions and these are the bad emotions. Uh -huh. Already at six, right, they're at like, six. this is good, yep. this is bad. So of course, we're gonna orient ourselves you know, to pleasure, not pain. We're gonna say the pain is bad, shut that up. But like the work that you've done on jealousy and that I, I've kind of stumbled into as well is, that jealousy feeling, I've just been missing the tools to translate those feelings, to understand what is it that's happening in my body and what am I really afraid of? And is that really real? Do I have maybe a belief that I, I'm ready to shift? Or perhaps this is like an old emotional wound that I've been holding on to and it's time to clear that out and heal. So this was a long winded answer Ken, to your question of where do people get stuck? I, I am so compassionate because I think it's a lack of our education is lack of examples in understanding mental framework, emotional support, somatic body work to even understand ourselves in this human world. I think we've got a little work to do, but I'm excited to do it. And I think I, I see you on the same path. Yeah. I love this, but the thing that captured my, like my, my whole heart just leapt forward when you said I get triggered and 
I, I hear so many therapists and coaches and counselors talk about getting curious when you're triggered, but I want to draw another round of attention to it because in my work, I so frequently see people get triggered and they'll report it as if it's happening to them. Mm. They, and that I think shuts down the impetus to curiosity. And so I'm hearing you say, you're able to be patient with yourself long enough to allow your prefrontal cortex to come back on. You can, you can soothe yourself a little bit. And I'm guessing you do some things to also actually allow yourself to drop into your body. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to people, if they're listening, if you can't comfortably drop into your body right now, then that's a process like widening the window of tolerance for that. It's not all or nothing. You don't have to get to a spot where you can sit with every feeling for the whole time you have it. Sometimes this is about, can I drop into that feeling for 10 seconds? Can I, can I drop in and just feel it for a little while and remember that the feeling, the sensation in my body and the emotions that are coming with it, they're no one's fault. Mm -hmm. They're just, they're happening. And it's, and just, just allow that for a moment. And I feel like there's a, I wish somebody could go back. I wish I could go back to a younger version of me and say, yeah, it's okay. If it's hard for you to even tolerate 10 seconds, because yeah. 10 seconds can turn into 10 minutes over the course of time. It's totally. Yeah. I love that, that compassion towards yourself and mm. for others. I feel like if we can feel that for ourselves and especially passive versions of ourselves, we can bring that to our partners. We can bring it to other people that we're interacting with and not to blame. You know, I think that that's actually, you, that's what you were pointing to is when you get triggered, not to blame someone and also not to blame someone that's experiencing this, that doesn't necessarily have tools to go through and say like, because it feels so scary, you know, when you get yeah, triggered, it's in your body. It's, it's like, oh my God, run, like run for your life. I'm going to die. <laughs> Saber tooth tiger time. And that's totally reasonable. Yeah. I remember though, the first time this happened to me and someone did tell me, what if you just sat with the emotion? And no one had ever told me that it was actually you. I was, so oh. the very first thing that happened to me in, I'd been a pretty angry and loud person in my life. Um, and he's, he's known me my whole life. So I'm sure you've seen early Jolie. I have seen, I'm aware. <laughs> um, but the first thing that happened when we opened up was um, I went through a divorce. My, my primary partner at the time was like, oh, hell no, I'm out of here. And it was really painful. It was very intense and it was really fast. It was 45 days from the day I said, hey, I don't know what I'm going to do, but this, I have feelings to our separation, wow. 45 days. And in that time, there was a day sitting in our backyard, in your backyard at the time, and you just said, what if you just sit and feel it? And I can't, I was 32 years old and no one had mm -hmm. ever said that to me before. Mm -hmm. I had sat in circles where we'd talked about all together having feelings. Like I'd sat in women's circles and we talked about holding feelings, but nobody had invited me to sit with my own. And it was a ground shaking moment that then needed, you know, a decade of practice to become tolerable, really. Yeah. What about you? What started you though? Cause there's a, there's a catalyst moment, I think for most people, what started you? I mean, it's not just opening up. Usually something else has to happen. What broke you open? What? So for me, there was a moment when if I'm talking just with my own ability to understand myself, that beginning of my own self-love journey, I remember being so frustrated. We were living in New Zealand uh, on a farm. It was very chaotic. It was a beautiful experience. And at the same time, I had no time for myself. And I remember yelling to Marty out of the car window, I don't know why I'm angry. I'm missing something. I'm just, I'm missing something. And I was so angry and frustrated. And I went, drove to a park. He was like, go chill out in nature for a little bit. I sat down in a park and I just cried by a tree. I just cried and cried and cried and let myself cry. And I finally realized when I stood up that I was missing me. Mm -hmm. Like that's it. Like I was missing me. And when I got that I could be there for me, <laughs> then that really shifted. And then I, I started realizing that 
I could be with those feelings. We had already even been practicing polyamory for two or three years at that point, but I don't think I had really gotten the, the gift that is polyamory, which is uh, emotional exposure therapy, we'll call oh, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> You open up and then you're with all the feelings and, yeah. and other I, people's and yours and then other people's and then yours and learning boundaries. And I just, I really do believe that all of this is a learning path. Yes. You know, there's a reason that we can sit here and only have talked once, you know, for, for one hour, maybe, or not ever before. And we, we can pick up like we've been old friends on a journey, right? Because there's so much of this path that is the learning. <laughs> if right. you choose it, if you choose it. And I see a lot of people going into those hard moments and granted, I know it's hard, but without the framework, and without empowering yourself to choose it and to say, I can go through this. I'm capable of it. I will learn. I will reach out. I will find community. A lot of people can just hit that first or the first couple roadblocks and go, no way, like just no way. This is miserable. I feel horrible. I don't want to do it, but I get sad because I feel like they're, that's the moment, you know, that's the opportunity is in those hard, hard moments to say, wait, there's, there's something here on the other side. And maybe intuitively you kind of knew for me, it was that like, oh, I'm missing myself. And it was a whole bunch of resources. I remember picking up a copy of um, Jessica Fern's PolySecure and reading the last part about how do I have a secure relationship with myself? So there have been resources along the way. I think I needed, I'm, I'm very much a self learner. I will go down this path. I mean, I was studying abroad uh, in, when I was 17. So I'm like, I'm an adventurer. I'm an explorer. I know myself to be like that. And as much as I want to say I learned by myself, I am so glad that people have walked this path before me. Mm, <laughs> I'm oh so glad yeah. for, for you two, for your wisdom, for the people that have written books and um, recorded podcasts that I got to listen to as I was learning and going, oh, I'm not crazy. This is actually like a thing. And they gave language to my experiences. They made me feel not alone. Um, I think we need all of this as we go on this crazy journey <laughs> because it's already so separate. But the more of us that can come together and share our learnings and actually outline a, a path, it's not a map per se, but it's more like a mental framework is the only way I can relate it. It's like if I can mentally understand that what I'm going through is not ab abnormal and I'm okay, uh, that helps me ground into my emotional body when it's not so secure. I love that. Yeah. I, you know what you're reminding me of, Megan, is that in fact, every human needs, they need models to make sense of, of their life, right? Most of us use most of our models unconsciously. That's normal. Um, and then when you do something that diverges from the mainstream. So if you're in, if the mainstream culture and, and if monogamy, if it holds you and it feels good, great. Like that's great. And all of the skills that we're all talking about here, they all work inside the monogamous container. And the reason I mention that is most of us that I know, most of the people I've met ever notice how good all their other relationships get when they go on this divergent path, because the divergent path just make, makes it really clear to you that you need to see and know those models. You need to understand what frameworks you're using. You need to understand, for instance, like what a boundary is for real, where you mm -hmm. might be able to, you might be able to get by on implicit rules in a simpler system. The system gets more complex. You need a map of the territory. And I'm super grateful that we, we did, we lacked models. Um, oh God, we lacked models. 2009 was yeah. still wow. a little early. <laughs> um, but what we did have was a couple of books that gave us some language and even just language changes things. So that's where I feel like all of us are contributing to uh, something that can only benefit our children's generation and, and, and onward because Every time we define the language and we help each other understand what it could mean, not just what it does mean written down once, but all the things it could mean. Um, for instance, the word compersion, like, how do you use it? How do I use it? How does it feel for you? How do you feel it? When we take a word like that and let it enter the general lexicon, yeah. now everybody's relationship game deepens. And that you said it, you know, nobody's teaching relationship relationships really in, you know, in schools and educational settings. And that's been my experience, including right up through three. Now I'm on my fourth psychology degree right now. I'm, I'm going to finish up in just a little bit. And most of them don't talk about relationships. Not really. So wow. 
I mean, really, this is an inside out world. This is yeah. a crazy upside down backwards world. And the more I go down this path, the more compassion I have for myself for having gotten through or lived the life that I've lived so far going, man, like where were those skills? Nobody was talking to me about this. And I am so, so first, congratulations for all of the additional education that you've done. For me, I'm, I'm doing the opposite. I'm like teaching now, I'm teaching the younger kids. Yep. Wish I would have learned. And it's yes. a simpler version. So I have created for adults a self-love journey that I walk through mind, body, um, heart, and spirit. And for the kids, I'm taking all of that and I'm adapting it so that we we do the class called Inside Out at school. Oh, because nice. most of the time information comes from outside in, outside in, outside in. That's kind of our traditional educational model. And for me, I want them to know that their inside world is just as valid. And so this is inside out class. What's happening? What's happening inside? What are those things that we call emotions? When does that come up? Um, even starting to give them different language instead of saying that this is a good emotion or bad emotion. This is, I use now the language. This is something that I like to feel, or this is something that's hard for me to feel. Mm. And then we talk about strategies when something's hard to feel. How do you move through that? What do you do? And I ask the kids themselves, I'm like everybody could say something different. How do you do it? So I want to start giving um, validation to them and their own natural learning for themselves. How do they treat their human body? How, when they get triggered, what works for them? What are the tools? And then they can share with each other and different things that they do. And I gamify a lot of stuff because I'm teaching from six years old all the way up to 16. So they need different things. Yeah. But that to me has been such a, that's my continued education to take some of these I love that. Yes. that I have. And I'm like, how do I, how do I em- help them embody it? How do I help them? And it's, you know, but every time you teach something, you learn it. And that's really when you learn that's it. That's it. That 100%. Uh, that's yeah. when you learn it. That's yep. why I keep teaching. That's exactly <laughs> why. So I, I have a question about that. I know you're in Costa Rica and we're in the United States and the, the culture is going to be different. But still, how did you find people who wanted to put their kids in a class like that? Oh, I love it. That's why I'm here in Costa Rica, because there's quite a community of people that are seeking a different life. Uh, There are people from all around the world that have left their country, and there are some uh, Costa Ricans in the school as well. So it's a good mix of people saying, you know what, that traditional educational model, we just don't think it's working. So I I didn't have to do anything special, really. It was the, um, it's a small school, there are about 60 students a really big age range. That's why I chose the school because they focus on a lot of different things, not just academics. And, um, and so I really, I had kind of pre-qualified the school for my values. (laughs) So I knew our values were already aligned. And then when the person that runs the school, she found out that I did this self-love program, she started listening to the podcast. And then she was like, Hey, would you want to come and teach this, some of this stuff to the kids? And, and then I just said, yes. So, I mean, honestly, I didn't have to do anything. It was just other people with really aligned values. And that's why I think we need to keep seeking. If we're not happy, there's two ways that we can shift our life, right? We can, we can reframe it. We can try to reframe what our current scenario is, or we can go out there and change it (laughs) like moving. And I, and I'm, I'm a firm believer in using both. Yep. <laughs> I, I think we just use the reframing all the time, but then don't change anything in our lives. That's not going to be helpful. And if we constantly are changing things, but not necessarily reframing how we look and feel about it, that doesn't help. So I'm like, well, which tool do I want to use? And uh, we just kind of, we knew that the States wasn't the right context for us uh, to raise our kids. So Costa Rica for the time being, and I love it. Mm-hmm. I I totally get that. I, I mean, we chose to homeschool our kids for pretty much the same reason. It was wow. a lot of people thought it was a religious reason, and I'm like, no, actually, couldn't be further from the truth. It's because I want them exposed to a lot of viewpoints, and it was hard to do yeah. in the setting we're in. It really is. Um, I give you all, all the credit in the world for picking up and and just going to a place that could align. Um, when I what I think though is there's something really there's some, there's a take home piece here for everybody listening, because what you're talking about, this idea of, of making relationships 
a core piece of how we educate children. I don't care whether you're living in Costa Rica or New England, whether you're sending them to Catholic school or the most alternative anything. Mm -hmm. Every parent I've ever met wants their kids to have that. So what's something that you would tell parents to do? What's a takeaway that they could have to just start? Uh, so for me, it's a question. I feel like I don't have a lot of answers, but I have a whole lot of questions. And for me, the question that keeps coming up, even as I'm in my day-to-day -day life and at the school, I keep asking myself, what's the difference between exposure and education? What's the difference wow. between exposure and education? If I expose my kids to something versus formal education, and I'm not quite sure there's a huge difference, mm. uh, really. So I think we need just a bigger frame of what, what does it mean to educate? And for parents to actually realize that they are constantly educating their children by who they be, you know, in their day-to-day -day lives. So, and, and that to me is probably the biggest mindset to have is, uh, you know, our formal, formal education starts at maybe five, six years old, maybe a little earlier in preschool, but really there's so much learning that has taken place through exposure mm -hmm. That I don't think, you know, we're in this society that's like this bucket over here is education and this is family life. And to me, those are anything but separate. They are inextricably linked <laughs> so much so that I am really just starting to, for me, myself, I'm like, what do I want to expose myself to? If mm -hmm. I am still learning and we all are right. As are. Adults, what do I want to expose myself to? And how conscious am I being about what I'm exposing myself to? So what news do I take in? What conversations am I participating in or overhearing every day? Because that's me being educated in this world now as an adult. So I think I've just gotten way more conscious of it. And I try to take that same filter to my kids and to say, like, what have they been exposed to? And, you know, how can I, in the education piece that I view is how can I formally ask them questions about what they're experiencing so that they can start processing for themselves, what it is that they're actually learning and mm -hmm. to give them that tool to, to process. Like that's the learning part. That's, that's the education part for me. It's more formal. I, I agree. The education yeah. piece is how do I teach them to go do this for themselves? The, how do I teach them to go seek learning and in the way that will be the right fit for them? Yeah. And I think they do that naturally. And I think if we do that for relationships too, if we kind of like took up the mold of what monogamy is or what relating is in general, if we just took that mold off and said, Hey people, uh, you know, what, what works for you? Like that, that's, that's how you relate. It doesn't have to be one way or the other. You get to create it however you want to create it for you. And guess what? That can change. If right. this works for a time period and then now you don't have kids at home and you want to relate differently, then relate differently. And so I think it's this model of going from uh, giving our power away to institutions like our educational systems, our healthcare systems. I mean, so much uh, religion, you know, that that's like a, the main one where it's like, I'm going to give my power away. Uh, but for us to start reclaiming our own power in our day-to-day -day lives of um, in all of those areas, right? And that's where for me, I keep seeing polyamory or practicing relationships um, in different styles as only one part of re-empowering ourselves in the world that I imagine. In the world I imagine, we can not only create our own relationships, but we're creating our own governance structures. We're creating our own healthcare uh, models. You know, we're we're creating much more instead of giving our power away to say, well, this is how it's always been, so that's how it's got to be. Right. So people who are interested in creation, in creativity, in a really, in a really holistic sense. Um, I mean, I think most people are, but maybe haven't given themselves permission and maybe a, a way to think of this in a, in a doable, you know, like tangible, small bite might be pick an area where you where you do feel like you can reclaim some of the power, it, literally empower yourself. Only you can empower you, empower yourself to expose yourself to something mm -hmm. new. And that's actually what I find most people reflect back to me about this podcast in particular. And I know you have one that might be another great listen for our listeners. Um, 
It's that they may not be polyamorous or wanting polyamory even, but they do want conscious relating. They do want to question the status quo. And so in its way, just listening to podcasts just is exposure to right. what there is. Right. I, and so I just want anybody who's feeling overwhelmed by all the possibilities, you might be doing it right now, right now. <laughs> That's a really good way to bring back from mine where I can go is all these heady, like, oh, this is what's possible, people. Come on, let's play to, oh yeah, hold on, Megan, grounded reality. Where are people right now? <laughs> it's totally, it's, this is spot on though. You're in Costa Rica. I'm in New England. It like, I can't that imagine that some more, yeah. right? Representative. Like, representative and, and of these different ways to travel in the spiral all the time, all the time. Mm-hmm. Megan, would you tell everyone where they can listen to you and where they can find you because I'm sure that people are going to want to hear more from you. Oh, thank you. And I love this conversation. I feel like it's already just too short, but oh, I agree. I, exactly. We're definitely going to have to have you back yeah. <laughs> to, to be continued. Uh, but yes, thank you for the opportunity here. I do have my own podcast. I'm about two plus years into it. It's called Amory, A-M-O-R-Y, Amory Podcast. Uh, I also have some online courses that I've put together really just as a a documentation of my own learning journey that I'm so happy to share. Uh, I know we overlap in the fields of being curious by by jealousy. Um, So I've got my own transforming jealousy. Um, What I one that I really love is the self love journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that to me is like a baby (laughs) that I birthed into the world. And uh, now I'm just starting to work with, uh, I worked with individuals, but now I'm going to start my first group program with people that are opening up and want some more support in that. So that's where I'm at right now. They can find me at emorypodcast.com or at emorypodcast on on, uh, Instagram. Wonderful. This is, it's so helpful to to me. I, I know sometimes Ken and I talk about feeling a little insular. It, it's funny how, open relating can can wind up feeling like because you don't fit into the mainstream around you it can wind up feeling oddly insular and Mm -hmm. it's really a delight to talk to somebody who is out there journeying and figuring it out and i'm so grateful for the work that you've created yes i really i'm so glad that there are more resources in the world for people so i thoroughly encourage our listeners to head over and check it all out Ditto, ditto. I watched your TED talk the other day. I'm like, yeah, Jolie, yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. More, more information presented in more ways. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This was so incredible. And we'll say to be continued. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Megan. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. I have one more thing to share with you. If you want to pop over to listen to Jolie.com, that's just listen to Jolie, J O L I.com, you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Yeah, get the guides. They're easy to implement conversations that will empower you to create the love you want. It's my mission to make everything talk aboutable sex, love, losses, and learns. Everything is talk aboutable. <laughs> She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my lovers, my friends, my family, and you all on a podcast, out loud. Relationship work really can change everything. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way you'd hoped, remember relationships can be messy and that's good news.